Uh, I'll introduce you now to our host for this evening, who is Marcy Ian, who I'm sure you know well as the co-host of Canada AM. Marcy. Hello, everybody. I love that you're all here tonight to celebrate this wonderful man. And really, really, Terry, just fantastic. So we were talking a, a little bit before we came out, and I said, it's been six years since the best laid plans. I don't know where time flies. But this, this newest book, No Relation, I was saying to Terry, I had a spit up my tea moment. <laughs> Several of them. And, and you'll find out why soon enough, because we will introduce you to Ernest Hemingway. Not the Ernest Hemingway, but, but Terry's Ernest Hemingway, who, who really begs the question when you go through this book and read it and spit your tea out and everything else, what's in a name? And we're going to start right there. But you know about Terry. I don't need to run through the illustrious resume. Best Laid Plans was self-published and then published and then a Stephen Leacock Award winner for humor. And the list goes on and on. This is his fourth novel. Let's get to it, shall we? Terry. I had to grab my coffee. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello. <laughs> They wow. all came out for you. That's a big crowd. I know. First and foremost, we've got to find Tim. Terry. We should get him to Terry's stand up. Tim. Tim, please stand Come on. up. Stand oh my up. gosh, I see him. You're Come identical. On. Hello, Tim. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> and your niece is here as well. My niece Sarah is here as well. Hello, niece Sarah. Welcome. Just so that there isn't confusion. That's true. I said to Terry, are you wearing the same jacket? This is a problem if you are. Well, Tim, in some book signings, Tim actually took the author photo for my, my <laughs> first novel. And we did one book signing where he was there, and he sat down next to me and signed the photo after I signed the book. <laughs> so. None of those hijinks tonight. That's right. Okay. So let's, let's get to, to no relation, OK? And I let everybody know that we're introduced to Ernest Hemingway. Mr. Hemingway is a copywriter, and he's done quite well in his, what, 15 years copywriting. And he goes into work one day, he's feeling pretty good because he's just had a promotion and life's good. He's got a girlfriend he lives with, he thinks that's good. It all comes crumbling down <laughs> within a 24 hour period. So I want you, Terry, without giving too much away, tell us how you came up with Mr. Hemingway. Well, it, it all started, I, I, I guess the seed for this novel was sown back in the late 1980s, 1989, I, th I think. And I was downtown at a client meeting uh, in a law firm. Uh, and I work in, the, in a PR agency, and one of our clients had a labor dispute going on. We met with a labor lawyer at Borden Ladner Gervais, and I walked in, and he introduced himself as, hi, my name is Brian Mulroney. <laughs> <clears throat> And of course, it wasn't that Brian Mulroney. That Brian Mulroney was prime minister at the time and was at the nadir of his popularity. And I just remember thinking, as soon as I shook this guy's hand, I'm so sorry, what must your life be like? Because <laughs> he, you can't go to his son's soccer game or the neighborhood barbecue or a conference or uh, you know, a dinner party without eliciting comments about his name. I'm sure he never once introduced himself in that period without someone saying something about it. Yeah. And I just thought, isn't that a terrible cross to bear? And that little idea kind of just stuck in my head. And I decided to, to blow it out into a novel. Interestingly, I phoned that labor lawyer 20 some odd years later when I was writing this novel. And I, I said, you won't remember me, but, uh, and he did remember me because I had spoken at a couple of events at their law firm, and he'd read my first novel, which was kind of him. So I asked him, would you mind if I told the story about this when I was describing the novel? And he said, no, not at all. So I think I, I named him in the acknowledgments, I think, and uh, so it's, that's where it started. It was just planted this seed of an idea of what must life be like when you live with a famous name. You're not famous. Your name is famous. You have what I call in the novel name fame. 
So that's where it started. Name, fame. And it's so interesting because this Ernest Hemingway in the book makes a big deal the fact that his name is spelt a little bit differently. So he's E-A-R as opposed to E-R for Mr. Hemingway. And he's got two M's in his surname as opposed to the one. So we'll have to pick it up at this day, OK? So Ernest is having a really bad day. He's got this boss who has done probably much better than he should have in his career. His name's Bob. And Ernest is lamenting the fact that he doesn't have a simple name like Bob, OK? Bob fires Ernest. Ernest goes home, right? And his living girlfriend is on her way out. So she's leaving, leaving him. On top of all of that, he's lost his wallet, and he gets himself down to the DMV because he figures at least he can make one thing right on this day. I'm going to read just a little excerpt about what happens at the DMV because the woman at the counter, after he's waited like three hours, four hours in line, she, he, he, he says, my name's Ernest Hemingway. She's like, right, buddy. Yeah, you're right. I don't have time for this. Next in line. And he goes berserk, OK? <laughs> goes berserk. And it's all on security video, right? So the, yeah, so it goes viral. And his sister calls him up later, and it's like, what is going on? You've gone viral. Look at whatever YouTube, whatever, whatever. And he's gone viral. So he goes and, and looks at that. And I have to just, so on, online, the, the, it says, famous writer flips out at the DMV. That's the title of it, OK? That's not it. So he's, he's thinking, oh, you know, who would have looked at this? 300,000 people have looked at it. 309,000 views. But this is the part, Terry, that I just want to read quickly, OK? So he goes down. You know how you can leave comments, right, after you view something? So he checks out the people that have actually, you know, that they kind of feel something for him. They don't feel so badly, OK? Listen to this. Leave him alone. Do you have any idea what it's like to live with a famous name? Do you? Trust me, it ain't great. So cut the guy some slack. His name? Jay Stalin. <laughs> OK? All right? And then, well, I'll just say, get off the poor sap's back. Try walking a mile in his shoes. And Bolin. <laughs> this is what we're doing with here. And I'll read, I'll read, read another. So he has all these supportive messages, one by F. Sinatra, one by Gerald Ford, S. Holmes, David Beckham, Margaret Thatcher, and the list goes on. We talked um, a little bit about writing process because you're an engineer by trade, and you told me something very interesting about how you set out to write. Share that with us. Well, as an engineer, an engineer never builds a bridge or a building without having a blueprint. And I don't write novels without having a blueprint. Uh, I don't just wait till the, the muse strikes me and just channel these stories. That doesn't happen to me. Uh, so I, I think through the story. It, it, I carry it around in my head for about a year before uh, the idea is, I think, matured enough to come out onto paper. And then I just map out a timeline, and then I plot it all out, and I develop chapter bullet points, chapter notes. So by the time I start writing, which is the very last thing I do in the process, I know everything there is to know about the story, or at least almost everything. And uh, I sit down when I'm finally ready to write, and I put the outline for chapter one, two or three pages of bullet points on the left side of my, right side of my screen, and I put the manuscript on the left side. And then I just write it from, the, uh, from my bullet points, which means I never get writer's block, which is something that Ernest Hemingway suffers yes, to a does. considerable degree in this novel, because I just have the whole story already laid out in front of me. So I, I prize efficiency above almost everything else. And I don't have a lot of time, so I don't want to write five drafts of my novel. I want to write one draft. So I don't start writing until it's already written up here. So let me ask you this. How do you, about, how do you write about writer's block if you've never had writer's block? <laughs> I read a lot about writer's block. <laughs> it took a while because some of the people who were writing about writer's block had writer's block, so it was challenging. But there is some literature out there about writer's block. And uh, it, it strikes people in different ways, but it is a very, a very real malady that strikes, uh, that strikes writers. Uh, it doesn't strike me because I don't write in that way. I think it strikes those who have difficulty knowing where their story is going. So they, they think they have writer's block, when I really think they just don't know enough about the story to keep writing. But. Interesting. There's a psychology there. <laughs> well, 
Uh, I'm not sure there's that much psychology yeah, there. Just, but, uh, <laughs> just, a, just a little, just a little bit. So tell me about Ernest and how much of you is in this character? Well, I, uh, certainly his voice is very much like my voice. And those discerning readers out there who may have read more than one of my novels may detect a similarity in narrators' <laughs> voices from novel to novel. Uh, I just find it easier to write in my own voice. And uh, I think writers who are trying to figure out what, they should, what's, what voice should, they should write in should start with writing in their own voice, because I think it's just easier to do that. Uh, other than that, there's, uh, well, there's not that much more about Hemingway in the novel that, that belongs to me. Certainly his voice does, his sense of humor, uh, and his love for his siblings, I guess, or at least his sister. But. Uh, so, <laughs> get that? Well, in the novel, he only has a sister, right. so. I wanted to clarify that. No, Tim's that not was not a me. shot at my, across my <laughs> brother's bow. <laughs> So when you, when you look at the characters that you've written about, you say they're, they're so much like you, and, and, and a lot of them are, the voice is yours. These characters go along life, and they've got a vision, right? And when things go off track, they don't always handle things, things no. very You know where I'm going with this, Terry. <laughs> they, they don't always handle things very well. So how does that translate to life? If think in best laid plans, when the best laid plans go awry, how does Terry Fallas handle them? Well, I, I try and stay calm above all else, but uh, you're right, in the novels, the narrators are seldom flawless heroes. I, I didn't really want to write people who had no warts at all, and my narrators tend to be a bit hapless, uh, a bit helpless, sometimes a bit hopeless, uh, <laughs> and I'm a little bit like that too. So. Uh, I, uh, I am the one who will step in the dog crap when I'm walking down the street. And uh, uh, so uh, I write about that with some authority in an earlier novel. <laughs> uh, so, but what I really try and do is I have a, an engineer's brain and uh, I very much try to remove the emotion from things and I rely on logic and reason uh, and a good sense of humor, which uh, certainly my family upbringing engendered in a big way. In fact, my brother will say that half the lines in these novels are his. But, uh, <laughs> but. Want to explore family a little bit more, because family is a big deal in this novel as well. This gentleman, Ernest, you see, has his, his own route planned out. He's going to be a writer, like Ernest Hemingway. He's going to do it his way and not his family's way. And the family has a clothing business. And his father has been in the business, his grandfather has been in the business, and of course he is supposed to continue, but, but doesn't want to do that. He wants to go his own way. So there's this real theme of family and what's right, and, and the journey you want to take as opposed to the journey that your family has set before you, right? right. Yeah. Now, family is something I hadn't really explored in much depth in the earlier novels, and it seemed like a logical place for me to go with this, uh, with this story. And you're right, he, the Hem, as he's known in the novel, is expected to carry on a four-generation family tradition of becoming CEO of the Hemingware Company. <laughs> uh, underwear. It's underwear. Which makes men's underwear. <clears throat> and he doesn't want any part of it. He doesn't really have a business mind. But he has a younger sister named Sarah, coinc not coincidentally uh, named after my, uh, my niece. Mm -hmm. And uh, she is a brilliant business mind, has an MBA from, I forget which university I, I made it from, but, uh, <laughs> but she's very smart, finished at the top of her class, is tough and incredibly intelligent, has great judgment, and would be an ideal CEO of the Hemingware Company, but because she is not the firstborn son and has the wrong anatomy, she, uh, her, their father is not even considering her, not even in the running. So part of this story is how you get a father with a very narrow, uh, rigid view of something uh, and open his eyes to other opportunities. And uh, as in most of my novels, there is a happy ending. But. Yes, there is, which is nice. Because in so many novels, it's, you, you've got a, it's open-ended, and you have to fill in the blanks, and you think, what happens to this character? Does that character make it? Not in this one. So that, that is lovely. Well, I'm, I'm an engineer. I want all the bolts to Everything be tightened tied up. at the end. <laughs> so. 
want to know how, how life has changed as a writer for you since the first one, since Best Laid Plans, and what you know now that you didn't know then. Because at that point, you were releasing this as a podcast, right? right. Because nobody was publishing it. And you took it upon yourself to say, you know what? No one else wants it. I'm going to do it myself. And boy, that worked out well. <laughs> but, but now that you're here and there are rooms full of people who are clamoring to, to hear you and, and to read your latest work, how has life changed that way? And has the confidence level changed from that time? Well, it's funny. A lot of people have said over the years that uh, you must have had such faith in your story in the first one, The Best Laid Plans, to keep going and put it out on, uh, as a podcast and then self-publish it. You must have had such faith. That wasn't it at all. I, I just wanted to know whether I had written a novel, and I really <laughs> didn't know. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't sure. And other writers in the room will know that when you labor over a manuscript, particularly your first one, for months and months and months, your sense of perspective on what you have written completely abandons you. And I honestly didn't know whether the story was holding together, whether the characters were believable, whether it was funny. And by putting it out as a podcast and eventually self-publishing, it was really my way of determining whether I had written something. Because I didn't believe my family members on what they said, because they loved me. And, <laughs> and I don't know whether what I would have done if my wife had said, you know, you should just stick to your day job. Yeah. Uh, so in a way, I took more seriously the comments I got on the podcast from people in other parts of the world who didn't know me at all then I, uh, I s sort of thought of them with a bit more credibility in my own mind uh, than I did my brother's comments or my nieces or my sister-in-laws or my wife's. Um, so uh, I've lost the question now. So um, what have I learned? Yeah. Well, it's funny. I, my life has clearly changed uh, as a writer. And, uh, I, and nothing fills me with greater pride and, and satisfaction and humility than when I am introduced as a writer. That is an extraordinary thrill still, uh, because this was something I dreamed about for a very long time, and it was such a distant dream that I never, it took me until I was 45 to, to try and write that first novel, because I just didn't think it would go anywhere. So I regret now that I waited so long. Um, so it has changed my life. I have tried very hard for it not to change me, because uh, I want to be the same person who wrote that first novel. Uh, and I, so I'm, when I'm sitting writing my novel on the third floor of our home in the library we built when we renovated our home, which is a room that's hard to get me out of, I, I, I swear it feels exactly the same as it did when I was writing The Best Laid Plans, and I'm very happy about that. No one else is in the room. I'm on the same desk. I have the same view. I have the same computer, usually. <laughs> And uh, I just try and stay in that mode. And I never believe my, my own PR. <laughs> I just try and keep that belt wrapped around my head so that uh, it is not allowed to swell. <laughs> and you run a PR firm, but you don't believe Well, I don't really run anything anymore. Uh, I, I work at the PR agency I co-founded 19 yeah, your years ago. Yeah, it is. It has does, your name and all. It has my name on it. But yeah. Uh, but I am just a glorified employee now, and I, uh, I, I still enjoy that. Uh, and I think it probably keeps my writing chops sharp, because I write almost every day for, yeah. for clients. Um, but uh, I do love the other side of my writing life, my creative writing life. And uh, I look forward to doing that for many years. And you will. You most definitely will. <laughs> it's a lot of stories yet to tell. A lot of stories out there. The social media aspect of your story Terry, is a big part of this, because that's where the podcast was born. This is where you, you talk and you write. Talk to us a little bit about how things have changed now that, well, the internet's been here for a long time, but that social media is at the state that it's at with regards to writing. Yeah, it really has opened up all sorts of new opportunities, and yeah. podcasting was was sort of the avenue I pursued very early on. I'd already been a podcaster. I started a, a show called Inside PR, a weekly half-hour show about the public relations industry back in 2006, April 2006, and, and uh, created that show and then co-hosted it for 200 and some odd episodes, uh, never missing a week. Uh, so I know how to podcast. I know how to edit and polish. And it was a great way to 
elevate our profile as public relations professionals. And when the best laid plans did not elicit any interest from the traditional publishing world, I, I mean, people say, you must have got lots of rejection letters. I didn't get any rejection letters. I didn't make a big enough impression on the traditional <laughs> publishing establishment <laughs> to get an automated rejection letter. <laughs> So I decided that I would podcast the novel. And I'm glad I didn't know this at the time, but back in January of 2007, nobody in Canada had podcast a novel in its entirety and given it away for free. I got the idea from a, a thriller writer in the US who had done it with considerable success. Uh, but, uh, and that's where it started. And I built up, a, I think, a, quite a sizable following of people who seemed to discover the novel. And, sent me very positive comments. And it was really instrumental in my decision to go ahead and self-publish it. I don't know if I, uh, without those very positive comments, whether I would have pushed the big red button to self-publish the novel. Uh, so it certainly opened a lot of opportunities for, for new writers to build a following and to, uh, to engage with readers and, and other writers. Uh, I hope people will follow me on, on Twitter, at uh, Terry Follis. Uh, and uh, it's, I've really enjoyed the interactions I've had. Tonight I've met at least one blogger who kindly reviewed the novel No Relation uh, and wrote a, a review on it, and I discovered it online and have put it on my, on my own blog. So it does build a community, and I think a lot of writers, uh, they don't want to engage in it because it, it really is an encroachment on their writing time, which is true. But in this day and age, writers, particularly writers who are just breaking onto the scene, and I sort of still think of myself in that way, um, you need to get out there and promote these novels and to build a following and to build an audience. So I, I'm a quite avid user of the social media platforms, Facebook and, uh, and Twitter, and I think it's been helpful for me, and it keeps me grounded. Because uh, I, I see the negative comments, too, that they, that they make. And uh, you know, just that's good to have. Uh, there's nothing like it for that, that instant connection. Right. There, there's nothing like that. The craft and then the people who are, are, are reading it or the people who are benefiting from it, right. whether it's positive or negative, it, it's important. It well, absolutely is. It's been a struggle for writers from time immemorial to find readers and to get that's their right. product into readers' hands. And the social media is, is a great, all of the platforms, it, it's a great way to connect and to spread the word and to gather more readers around you. So I think it's, a, it's part of what ought to be in the marketing arsenal of any writer. Tell us about the title, No Relation. And clearly, as we've told everybody, and some of you may have read it already, but we've told everybody, Ernest Hemingway, no relation to Ernest Hemingway. But is there something else there? Uh, not really. That, it, was, uh, it was a line that he uses so often and that most people with famous names end up using. It's this little suffix that goes on at the end of every encounter they have when they have to introduce themselves. I'm Ernest Hemingway, no relation. And I, it just happened so often that I thought that would be an appropriate, uh, an appropriate title for the novel. There are other implications when you think about the word relation and how it connects with family. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have to confess that was a bit of an afterthought. But now that I've noticed that, I will embroider. I actually thought of that. An important you can strategic work that in. insight there. Because that's what I thought. I thought the relationship with his father. That's his really sister, what was driving it, yes. <laughs> that's what I thought. Yes. I thought, okay, that no relation, but I thought there's more there. Well, now that I've, uh, I've connected this, I will make sure that that gets part, <laughs> part of my, my patter from now on. But, uh, but I, and it's funny, I, for all of my novels, except for my third novel, I have had the title for them before I wrote the novel. That doesn't surprise me at all. Well, as an engineer, maybe yeah, not. No. I, I, doesn't and I, it was very un, somewhat unsettling. To, and disquieting to have to be writing my third novel up and down without a name for it, and just sat there on my computer files as novel number three. And uh, it was strange, and I, I just could not find a, a good title for it. And frankly, I'm not overwhelmed with the title we ended up with. Uh, and I thought of it, but it just, I think it works on several different levels, maybe six levels, maybe five. Um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, it's nice to be back when I, I've had this, uh, I had that title before I wrote the novel and I've got the title for my next novel already sorted. So it just helps ground me in, in that story, I guess. But. Do you consider yourself naturally funny? Are you uh, the class I... clown <clears throat> in engineering class? Uh, 
I don't know that I consider myself naturally funny. I really enjoy humor. And I know that when I'm in a conversation with somebody, particularly good friends, it is a, a sort of a natural role that I slip into that's very comfortable, that something will come up. And, and I won't be trying to do it so that I will get them to laugh and won't that make me feel good. It's just part of my personality, I think, to, uh, to throw in some funny lines. And I often walk away from those conversations and turn a corner and note some of the lines down <laughs> for, uh, for future use. But, but when, I'm, when I'm writing the novel, the, most of the humor only comes at the writing stage. Sometimes I'll have a funny line or a funny set piece that will be in the outline, but often it's in the creativity of stringing the words together when the humor will come to me, not unlike it does when I'm sitting around the dinner table or talking with friends. That's how it happens. So. Who makes you laugh? Ah, who makes me laugh? Uh, well, I, there have been some, some great novelists over the years that have been, uh, in a way, role models or, or mentors. They don't know that they're mentors, but they, they have been. Uh, people like Robertson Davies, who, I mean, perhaps isn't laugh out loud funny, but he is very droll and very wry uh, and incredibly uh, eloquent in his writing, a wonderful writer. Mordecai Richler has made me laugh for many years. Uh, Paul Corrington has made me laugh. Uh, John Irving is uh, a very important writer to me. Uh, he is John Irving who really taught me the power of juxtaposing humor and pathos and sometimes rubbing them up right against one another in the same paragraph. Uh, and I've read John Irving novels where I am splitting my side, laughing on one paragraph, and all of a sudden this lump blossoms in my throat as I read the next sentence. And I think that's a powerful effect. And so I, I hope that when I write my novels, there's a broader emotional bandwidth in them than just simply a comic novel where you're lapping above the line. I want to go below the line a few times. And, uh, and uh, I hope that uh, that makes it a, a more meaningful journey, because life is not just uh, uh, laughing all the time. But. No, it's not. You know, you mentioned John Irving. And, and I've got a copy of A Prayer for Owen Meany. Oh, and it is, it's my favorite book. See, I yes, knew I liked I you. <laughs> I knew I liked you. And it's in the middle of my library at home. I right. love that book. Yeah, it's, love uh, it. And the strange thing about A Prayer for Owen, who's read the, A Prayer Has for Owen Has anybody read Meany? A Prayer? Did you yes. love it? Yeah. If you were to put a, a, a gun to my head and force me to give you my all-time favorite novel, which is a terrible thing to do to an inveterate reader, uh, I would probably have to say a prayer for Owen Meany. It's my favorite, too. But what's interesting is I only read it once back in the late 80s, and I have been scared to read it a second time. As the years pass, my fear mounts, because uh, I, I, I want it to be my favorite novel, and I don't know whether it would be reading it a second time. Somebody assured me last week at a reading that read it again, you will love it just as much. So uh, Just don't see will, the movie. Yeah, oh, no, I, I never did. Yeah, neither did I. I never did. Yeah, no, don't <laughs> bother. Did. Don't bother with that. Tell me a little bit about, about your family, uh, your wife, and your kids, and, and whether or not you bounce ideas off them. You mentioned that at the beginning, they said, oh, yeah, best laid plans, great, great, great. But do you still bounce ideas off them? Who reads stuff first? It's funny. I, well, I've been married for 27 years. Congratulations. To, thank you. It's lovely. Uh, to present company excluded, the smartest woman I know. Um, <laughs> And we met in university when I was campaigning door to door in the women's residence. I uh, love that. <laughs> I wasn't nice campaigning one, for a girlfriend. <laughs> nice one. I love it. I was campaigning nice for a, a Canadian Federation of Students referendum. I was mm -hmm. heavily involved with student politics at, uh, at McMaster. Yes. Uh, and we met and uh, have pretty well been together uh, ever since. I have two sons, 21 and 19, Calder and Ben. Uh, and uh, one is a very avid reader, uh, who he's in third year, uh, fourth year, going into fourth year at U of T, studying Greek and Roman civilizations. Mm -hmm. And uh, one son who is not a reader, uh, but he is an actor. He's in the, uh, the theater program at, at Brock University in the performance stream. Uh, and uh, they're wonderful. We have one happy family. Uh, but as for readers, I think Tim is probably uh, among, uh, he probably is the first reader. Uh, who, he's read, uh, I think, all of them, or at least most of them, uh, before almost anyone else has read them and uh, has given me insight and comments that, uh, 
being right immersed in it, I haven't been able to see sometimes. And it's always useful to have somebody who will give you straight advice. And Tim doesn't always uh, try to, uh, you know, spare my feelings. So. <laughs> He's got that little smile it's, on his face, Tim does. It's useful right to have a reader who will give you the straight goods. And uh, so it's been very helpful uh, for that. What did you learn, if anything, Terry, uh, writing, writing this? Were there life lessons along the way for you? I know you said everything was laid out and everything else, but did you learn something about you by the end? Uh, I think I learned, certainly from uh, the first novel, uh, from the first to the second, mm -hmm. uh, I have learned to trust my characters and the story uh, more than I was trusting it in the first novel. And I think if you are, uh, if you read the first novel closely, you will see a writer who is a little bit unsure of himself uh, who is probably grasping a little too hard for humor in places. And I felt that I needed, I felt I needed to do that because I didn't know whether the story was actually working and that the characters would be holding the attention of the readers. And I've been assured by enough people since that uh, the, the story can, you can carry the, the novel on the backs of the story and the characters. So I think uh, you will see that the humor is still there. I don't think I will ever write a novel without humor. But it's perhaps toned down a little bit. And I perhaps have attenuated my humor judgment a little bit and uh, try to discern when I've gone too far, when I should dial it back a little bit. And sometimes less is more. Actually, often less <laughs> is more. Uh, and I sometimes find that I, I will pound things into the ground when I probably don't need to. Just kind of let it be. Yeah. Let, and, it, let it slide. Right. But that doesn't seem to really be part of who you are. Is who that I hard am? to let it slide? Uh, no, not really. Uh, not really. I, I really, I listen carefully to what readers tell me. And yeah. I, I believe readers sometimes more than my own judgment. Sometimes I get conflicting advice, and then I have to rely on my own, uh, my own sense of, of what to do. Uh, because in the end, it will be my name on the book, so I want to make sure I'm comfortable with it. But I learn a lot from, uh, from readers. Uh, and I once had a, had a, a reader, of a, an early reader in the manuscript. I don't think she's here tonight. Is, uh, is Abadne here? No, I don't think Abadne's here, no. But she's a good friend of mine. She's a writer uh, as well. And she read something, and she wanted there to be more sex in the... Uh, in the, you, the sex scenes in my novels tend to be very... You know, it's off stage, very much off stage. <laughs> and she thought, you know, you should show us that sex. And, and I thought about it long and hard. I understood why she would say that. And then I decided that my narrators weren't that kind of, they, they wouldn't do that. I don't think yeah. they were too, too modest, I think, to do that. And they, they wouldn't. So I, I decided in the end not to, to be a little more overt with the, uh, the sex scenes. But, but, but I, have, I have learned. Uh, I've learned to trust my own judgment a little more. Uh, I've learned that I no longer worry that I'll be able to write a novel. Uh, I certainly worried about that when I wrote the first novel. And when I finished it, I worried about whether Even I had written a novel. Even after you finished yes, it. Yeah. I've done it, but could I, can I do it? Right. So the, the very positive response has been so gratifying that uh, I, know, I now focus on what the story is going to be, how I can tell it in a compelling, thoughtful, humorous, you know, meaningful, sometimes moving way, uh, without worrying about whether I'm actually going to be able to write the story. I, I'm, I'm over that obstacle now, I think. When you wrote the first, were you thinking about the second? Did you have an eye on the second? The only time I had an eye on the second novel was right towards the end. And I think it's literally the last line of the novel is a big door opening uh, to give me room to write a second if I would ever get that chance. So I wanted to build in the flexibility. But really, when I wrote the first one, I was just trying to get through the first one. And 100,000 words is a, is a lot of words to write. And, uh, you know, and I'm, I, there's no exaggeration or hyperbole when I tell you that I really didn't know whether I'd written a novel on the first one. Uh, that may sound disingenuous, but. I didn't know. Uh, I was just so immersed in it that I didn't know. So it, having the, those podcast comments, those reactions you said, you know, complaining about waiting a week for the next chapter, that was, uh, that was music to my ears and made me feel uh, like I could actually carry on. And carry on, you did. So now the fourth and who you are now as a writer, is there an eye to the fifth? 
Oh, there's not just an eye to the fifth. Ah, I am, breaking uh, news. <clears throat> I know okay. I'm, I'm deep into, uh, into mapping out the fifth. The outline for the fifth is almost, almost done. I would say, if I could just get some time to get to it, uh, I hope to be writing in the summer on number five and hope to have it finished by the fall, uh, which means it probably won't come out until the following September, I would think. The, the wheels of publishing grind slowly. My, my wonderful publicist, Frances Bedford, is here somewhere at, at the back, probably. Uh, and she knows that you know when I finish it, th it goes out of my mind for a long time, because I will move on to the next one. And then eight months, nine months later, the book is released. So I haven't really looked at No Relation since uh, probably, at least in a meaningful way, la late last summer. I know, it was so funny when we were coming up here and I said to Terry, so I'm going to read this part about, you know, Ernest at the DMV because I loved it so much and he didn't have a copy of the book. I said, I've got mine. Yeah, don't, don't worry about it. I've got mine. Did you want to read anything? Did you want to read a favorite part before I go on? Well, I, I, would people like to hear it? I think so. I think so. <laughs> why don't I, rather than setting up something in the middle of the book, why don't I just read a few pages from Please. the beginning? Does that Please. make sense? The beginning's great. Please. Shall I just do it from my... Yeah prone position? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, this is uh, chapter one. <clears throat> What's in a name? For many, nothing. For some, not nothing, but not much. For a very few, blessed or cursed, it's everything. I'm one of those few. And if you're wondering, I usually count myself among the cursed. When I turned 40, I lost the desire and even the ability to sleep in, so I was an early riser. Yet at 7.45, I still wasn't the first into the office that morning. I heard him as I crossed our marble lobby past the futuristic reception pod where Angela and her headset would soon be stationed. He called out to me from down the hall. Morning, Hem. Uh, you got a minute? Bob was standing just outside the corner office, the corner office, his corner office at the end of the corridor. This was not good news. Bob was never in before 9.30, and when he eventually did arrive, it was to start a work day that was almost always devoid of any real work. Bob. 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 <laughs> I've never really liked the name Bob. <laughs> it's just so short, simple, primitive, unrefined. In fact, I have a theory on the name's origin. Six million years ago, when the early hominids first discovered their vocal cords, I think the sound Bob may well have been <laughs> among their first harsh guttural utterings. Shortly after, grr and ah would have come Bob. <laughs> Short, simple, primitive, unrefined, much like Bob himself. Conveniently, I disliked Bob as a person as much as I did his name. We joined the New York ad agency, McDonald Clark, within weeks of each other nearly 15 years ago, but we'd been on different trajectories ever since. Over the years, I rose through the ranks as if I were sauntering up a gentle slope, stopping often to lounge at patio rest stations along the way. But soon after we started, Bob seemed to board the space shuttle. <laughs> docking with the corner office after what seemed to me like a very short ride. How it happened so fast, no, how it happened at all, was more <laughs> a mystery to me than Bigfoot. <laughs> I still cannot fathom how Bob parlayed his principal assets of incompetence, paranoia, and mediocrity all the way to the top. But there he was, McDonald Clark's general manager, waving me in to his palatial enclave with an expression on his face that suggested his next words just might be, grr and ah. <laughs> on the other hand, despite the shortcomings, I'd be thrilled to have a name like Bob. Sure, Bob. I turned and followed him in. He led me to the couch, an easy chair at one end of the office far away from his barren desk where very little work was ever done. I took a spot on the couch, lowering myself into what felt like upholstered quicksand. I sank in so deep that when I stopped, I could almost rest my chin on my knees. I wondered how I was going to get back out. Bob sat in the chair across from me. Uh, so, Hem, uh, how have you been? Uh, just fine, Bob. You? Uh, awesome, thanks. Q. 
cue awkward silence. Bob shifted his position in his chair. I tried to shift my position, but the couch simply wouldn't let me. <laughs> well, I guess you've heard the rumors. Well, actually, Bob, I've been here too long for that. I make it a point never to pay attention to stray rumors or anything else I may encounter in these hallways. If I see a colleague crying in the corridor or yelling at an intern or moaning in a bathroom stall, I quickly make a show of checking my watch, turn around fast, and head back the way I came. That's my policy. So no rumors have reached these tender ears. So you really haven't heard anything? No rumblings? Nothing? Not a peep, Bob. Should I have? His face clouded. Come on, Hem, you're not helping. We plant these rumors for a reason. <laughs> I love that part. Love it. They help the condition the staff and prepare them for bad news. Strategic rumors are an important part of our internal communications program. You're a senior guy. You've been here a long time. You should know that. Well, I'm sorry, Bob. Had you flagged and tagged them as strategic rumors from the corner office, I probably would have paid more attention. <laughs> Shit. Bob, I'm a copywriter. I sort of work on my own. I just follow the brief and try to think up the right words and how best to arrange them. That's what copywriters do. I don't really hang out much with the account teams. I'm generally oblivious when it comes to office gossip. Shit. Well, what's this all about? Bob sighed and then looked at the ceiling as he spoke. You're out, Ham. It's over. We have to let you go. Today. Now. I'm sorry. I laughed. Well, it was more of a chortle. You're kidding, right? I looked around the office. Where's the camera? This is for the Christmas party, right? I could tell from his face. No, this wasn't for the Christmas party. I just looked at him for a moment as the news settled over me like ash from an angry volcano. Bob, I'm shocked. I don't understand this. I'm hurt. You could have at least given me some warning. Well, shit, Ham. I floated the balloon last week. You seem to be the only one in the office who didn't pick up on it. <laughs> Come to think of it, in the last few days, folks had been kind of giving me the cocked head, arched brow, sad eyes routine as they hustled by. Bob, I've been here 15 years. I've won awards. You promoted me last year and gave me what I thought at the time was only a modest raise, but still, you did give me an increase. Hem, calm down. Calm down? That was a surprise. Incarcerated in that couch, how could I look anything but calm? I could only move my upper body. I guess I may have been waving my arms around a bit. <laughs> I am calm, calm and flabbergasted, calm and furious, calm and apoplectic. What possible rationale can you have for firing me? Ham, we're not firing you, we're just letting you go. <laughs> we're thanking you for your years of service, giving you a generous settlement and parting ways. That's all. It happens all the time in the agency world. Well, it's never happened to me, and you still haven't explained why. Ham, come on, you really don't know? You're a long-form copywriter. You're a relic. The world has changed. In fact, it changed a decade ago. I'm amazed you hung around this long. Everything is short and punchy now. We live in the 140-character universe. Ad agencies don't need long-form copywriting anymore. We held out as long as we could. I'm sorry. But I'm good at my job. I'm in on virtually every new biz pitch. My writing has won the agency awards. I'm good at my job. I'm great at my job. Come on, Hem. Don't fight this. Don't make this difficult, he soothed. He pulled an envelope from his jacket pocket and held it out to me. Hem, you've got a huge package. Well, it's kind of you to say, Bob, but I'm really more interested in the settlement you're offering. <laughs> <clears throat> Perhaps I shouldn't have deadpanned. Bob was, Bob was befuddled. I opened the envelope. The check was for the equivalent of a year's salary. Wow. It's well above the legislative requirements. Don't bother trying to negotiate. This is as much as I could get for you. If you choose to push back, the offer will be withdrawn, and you'll receive the bare legal minimum. Bob said this part like he was reading me my Miranda rights. <laughs> I know I should have fired back with both barrels blazing, but I really wasn't good at this. I was out of things to say. I had nothing. Ham, think of this as a gift. You've got at least a year to do what you want. You can finally write your novel. Think of this as freedom. Freedom? Yeah, freedom. I wanted to swear like they do in the movies, but I just couldn't get it out. My civility instinct prevailed. Hem, you got to go see Marlene. She has all the paperwork. You need to sign it all if you're going to keep that check. He said this almost in a whisper, as if he were talking me off the ledge. Pop back in here before you go. 
I nodded and tried to get up. Bob, do you mind? I reached out my hand. Sure, Ham. He pulled me up and out of the couch. Let's stop there. Isn't that great? Great, fantastic. So good. So good. They loved it. <laughs> did, you, did you love it? Did you recognize how good it was as you were reading your own words? How did that feel? No, it's, uh, it was strange. This one is... Uh, this one was, was different in that uh, I really felt strongly about the third novel, Up and Down. I, I really connected with the, the character Landon Percival in that novel, and I loved that story, maybe because it, it sort of played on my 25 years in the public relations agency world and a very almost lifelong fascination with the space program. So I was really writing about things that were close to me, or at least that I understood very well. This novel, it really just started with this encou chance encounter 20 some odd years ago in a law office and, and really just relied on my experience as a writer, which isn't really that long. So I, I was a little bit unsure of this. I remain a little unsure of it because uh, it doesn't quite have the same spine of a, of a social issue like, like uh, our terrible brand of politics we have in this country now or in up and Ooh. down. Canada-U.S. relations, or ageism, or sexual equality. Uh, there were some other issues that underpinned those first three novels. Mm -hmm. This one, really, it's, it's family that is the anchor. So I was a little less certain about it. So I'm glad that uh, people seem to be receiving it well. Yeah, no need to be less certain, right? It's good stuff. <laughs> it's great stuff. So at this point, uh, Terry, and I guess we've got to do a question and answer soon. Yes, Tina? I guess we better get there. I'm always talking up a storm, and I forget about time. Um, is, is there anything uh, that you don't have with regards to, you know, not just writing, but life that, that you still want? What's on the bucket list? Uh, you mean that might go into another novel? Or? That's what I'm trying to get hmm. to, yes. Or, or maybe give us a little bit of what, what might be in this fifth one coming up. Well, the fifth one, um, well, I, I was very active in the student movement in my university mm -hmm. years and somehow managed to persuade the students at McMaster to elect me president of the Students' Union, which was really an event that changed my life and pushed me down the path to, into politics. Uh, but there is a, those of you who have been active in the student movement may know that there's a very strong feminist strand in the student movement, and those were issues that were, were and are very important to me. And uh, this fifth novel is my feminist comic novel. Uh, and uh, it's called, or I think it will be called, Poles Apart, uh, and it's about uh, the world's leading feminist blogger uh, who didn't get there on purpose. It's actually a young man. Uh, nobody knows it's a man. I love uh, it. it. It's anonymous, and he writes this blog, he, just by sheer coincidence, he writes this world leading, leading feminist blog that Oprah has put on her show. Um, <laughs> he writes it above, from his little apartment, above a very high class men's club that has gone in below. And the pole for the exotic dancers attaches on his floor underneath his desk where he writes. <laughs> so he's writing this world famous blog called Eve of Equality, because his Eve name is equality. Everett. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, no one knows he writes it, and the pole is vibrating and squeaking under his foot while he's writing this. And uh, so there's. Uh, I, I hope it will be it will be fun, but I hope also that it explores uh, some of those important issues that I've felt strongly about for a long time. So I, I think that you know, rather than writing a rage-filled nonfiction polemic about politics or about uh, sexual equality, equality of, of gender equality. Uh, nobody would have read that. So I like to cloak, I do it by stealth. I cloak it in a funny story. Uh, but I do hope that people will uh, discern the more serious themes that underlie the fun. Love it. Love it already. <laughs> Love it already. All right, we're going to open up the floor, everybody. I'm sure you're full of questions. You'll be going to this mic right here uh, in the center. Please feel free. Ask a question of Terry. Settle down, there's time for I everybody. Know. Settle down, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Ooh, this is tall for me. There you go. Okay, so 
I'm one of those lesser creatures who doesn't have the whole story figured out before I start writing and then hit writer's block like a <laughs> fool. Um, You're you, not alone. <laughs> you have the whole story percolating in your head, basically. So my question is, what kind of questions do you ask yourself in order to flesh out the plot? And what are you thinking about in order to make that story um, basically from A to Z? That's a very good question. Um, I hope everyone heard it. Uh, I, I lean heavily on the word verisimilitude, which is a word I practiced in the parking lot before coming in here, <laughs> just so I could toss it off like that. But it's a writerly term, and as I understand it, it means that even though you're writing fiction in a novel, it ought to be plausible. It ought to be believable. It ought not to challenge the, the, the reader's credulity too much. They ought to be able to read it and go, okay, I'm, I, I can stay with this story. It's, it's believable. So the questions I ask is when I go from, I sort of know the general arc of the story uh, over time. It's still not on paper then, but it's, it's coming to me over time. But I want to make sure that, uh, that it's believable. So I, I ask questions like, okay, are people going to believe that I can go from point A to point B? Or do I need a different way to get there? Um, and in this novel, I'm sure that people are thinking, you can't write a novel where the guy's name is Ernest Hemingway. Like, come on. And he's a writer? That's a bit too much to, to fathom or to, to accept. So I spend the first chapter uh, going through, uh, in a way, the family history that I think makes a very uh, compelling and plausible argument for why someone can exist with the name Ernest Hemingway. Uh, the patriarch of the family was born five years before the writer Ernest Hemingway was even born, and he's named Ernest Hemingway for an, for an important reason, uh, not the least of which is that his last name happens to be Hemingway, <laughs> which is not that uncommon a name. So I am forever uh, making sure that it's believable, and sometimes it means adding a scene so that I don't have to make a jump cut from here to here. I go through a transition scene that helps bring the reader along so that they will accept it when they get to this point in the story. So you're saying you start off with the outlandish events and the outlandish elements, and then the rest of the story is just grounding those elements in between. That's probably not a bad way of describing it. I, I tend to take characters that are the least likely characters that I can create to drop in a certain situation. So who's the least likely character you can imagine arriving on the floor of the House of Commons as an accidental MP? And how about a 60-something mechanical engineering professor with wild hair and a long beard with his lunch in it uh, <laughs> who doesn't care about politics, really? And I said, yeah, that, yeah, that would work. So then I had, to, I had to figure out, well, how do you get him there in a way that, that doesn't challenge the reader's credulity? And so I, I work hard, long and hard at making sure I, I can concoct this story uh, that will get there. And, and up and down the novel uh, of the, about the citizen astronaut program, who's the least likely Canadian citizen astronaut to fly the shuttle and spend a week on the space station? How about a skinny 71-year-old lesbian bush pilot doctor <laughs> who lives on a glacial lake in northern BC? I said, yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> but then you've got to work hard to make sure that you can put her, put her on the space station in a way that people will accept it. Uh, so I don't know if that's much insight, but that's, that's how I try to do it. Uh, Thank you very much. Pleasure. Keep writing. Keep the faith. Um, hi, Terry. Hello. First of all, I'd like to say I'm really excited to hear you speak today. Um, I'm very interested in politics as well. To be here with an author who is uh, so well-spoken um, is amazing. And um, I, I just want to know, as somebody who's starting off as a writer, what kind of advice do you give to individuals if you could draw upon some of your own life experiences going back you know, 10, 15, 20 years? What do you do to start? Well, that's a good question, and an age-old question for writers. And sometimes I've met writers who say, I'm writing a novel now, and I say, well, what is it? And they say, well, it's about vampires. That's the hot thing. I'm writing about vampires. And I say, well, do you care about vampires? Do you know anything about vampires? And she goes, no. And uh, I think it's hard to write with authority and authenticity and conviction. If you're writing about something because it's a, a marketing technique as opposed to something you really feel. So 
I'm always encouraging writers to write in their own voice and to write about something that they care about and that they know about. Because even if you research something long and hard so that you're an expert in it, it's still sometimes hard to give it that, that, uh, that air of authenticity uh, if, you've just, if it's just internet knowledge that you have gathered for yourself. So uh, I, th I like to plumb the depths of my own life. And uh, there are pieces of my life strewn about the pages of, of at least the first three novels in particular. Uh, and, and it's not autobiographical. It doesn't have to be autobiography. I'm not telling writers they should write memoir. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that if you care about something and you know about it and you've lived through it, you can write about that with greater authority than someone who hasn't, perhaps anyone else who, who ha hasn't. So uh, it's, uh, I think it's, that's probably good advice. Um, and I, don't, I also recommend that you not worry about what happens at the end. I don't mean of the manuscript. I mean, after you've finished it, uh, is it going to be published? What do I need to do to get it published? Uh, don't worry about that. Worry about the manuscript. Make the manuscript the best that it can be. And worry about the publishing journey and all the travails and challenges and tribulations that come with that uh, afterwards. Like, really immerse yourself in, in the writing, because that's what's going to get you to the next stage. I don't know I'm, if that I'm was so, helpful, but... I'm sorry. I'm so glad that Marcia asked you about the writing process, and you talked about that um, in some detail. Do you actually take pen to paper and do all that plotting, or are you using software? Uh, I'm, well, the software I'm using is Microsoft Word. I, I am not... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> which I don't even think of as software. Uh, there are novel writing right. software packages out there, right. and... I just never felt, I didn't want to get locked into some pattern, some way to write a novel. I just wanted to rely on what I thought were my own engineer's instincts on how one might go about writing a novel. So there is pen and paper involved. That's at the very earliest stages uh, where I'm, I'm often taking notes or I have a timeline that I have jotted down where I literally write little notes on this timeline, beginning of the book, end of the book, and what might happen. Uh, and then I'll even do short chapter summaries. Uh, it's quite a methodical process for me. I'm a big fan of chapters that are of, um, of common lengths. I, I tend to write chapters that are anywhere from about 4,600 words to about 6,000 words, averaging about 5,230 words. Of course. <laughs> but I, and I don't know why I do that. I think it's... I think it gives the novel a certain cadence, and, and a reader comes to rely on the fact that they've got half an hour, they can read the next chapter. Uh, I always feel short change when I read a three-page chapter in a book. Uh, so I will start doing chapter notes in pen and paper, just little notes, in a, usually in a moleskin notebook. Uh, but it's not that long after that that I move to the, to the Microsoft Word and I start uh, I have what I call, not to geek out on you too much, but in this... <laughs> Please do. The, the, in, no rela or in the new novel, sorry, not in no relation, in the new novel I'm working on now, I have what I've called a chapter map, which I haven't used before, but it's really a table with a box for each chapter, and I'm putting tiny little bullet points in there about what happens writ large in each chapter. So I can literally look at almost one page and see the whole story flowing, uh, which helps me determine whether or not I really should spend a bit more time here because it's too abrupt to go to here. I, I want there to be a, a rhythm and a flow to it, and sometimes it's easier to see that on, on one page. Uh, but eventually I get to writing chapter notes. Okay. And uh, if you decide to write in this way, I would, and I'm not urging you to, uh, just if it helps you, that's great. But writers write in so many different ways. Uh, I would just say that don't shortchange the, sh the chapter notes. I did that on my third novel, Up and Down. I was so eager to get to the writing that I kind of phoned in chapter five and six in my outline. And when I got to writing the, the manuscript, I had to stop and go back and think. And it interrupted the flow. And I haven't made that mistake again. Uh, but I'm very careful to say I'm, I'm not suggesting you write this way. It's just what works for me. Uh, I went to hear Richard Wright speak once, the, the author of Clara Callan, one of the great right. works in Canadian literature. Correct. And, uh, and you've heard how I write. He says in his talk, he said, 
I couldn't get my ass in the chair in the morning <laughs> if I knew where this story was going. And for some writers, that's what fuels them, is figuring out where the story goes while they're writing. Yes. For me, that would stop me dead in my tracks. Uh, I, I need to know the whole story. But we start in the same place, we end up in the same place, but the path from beginning to end can be very different, and there's no one way to write. So you have to figure out what, what works for you. Great. Well, thanks for being so candid. I really yeah. appreciate it. And Marcia, you're equally beautiful in person as oh. you are on television. Oh, <laughs> Well, thank you, Manjeet, and this is, Manjeet is thank writing you. a book, too, I think. So. Would you like some water? Thank you, good idea. There you go. Please. Wow. After those two, my question seems kind of superficial, but I was wondering, how do you write your female characters? Because I know, you, like, if you give your voice to your main characters, could you do that to a female character? I don't know if you'll try that sort of in your fifth as you've got your blogger working, because um, Landon Percival didn't sort of seem a, the traditional kind of female character. So right. I was just wondering how you... Well, that's a good question. And as a, certainly as a writer, in the early stages of when I was writing The Best Laid Plans, there was a time when the Angus McClintock character... No, sorry, when the Daniel Addison character was going to be a woman. I was going to write it in a woman's voice. And then I said, don't be an idiot. This is your first <laughs> novel. You, <laughs> how are you going to put yourself in a woman's shoes? And I, so I slapped myself upside the head and... Uh, and decided to write in a man's voice, one that sounds remarkably like my own. Um, but the women characters were fascinating to me, and, and it, was the, it was writing the uh, Muriel Parkinson character in the first two novels that made me want to write more about an older woman, which is where the Landon Percival character came from. And I was uh, unsure of writing women characters, and I, I don't, I mean, I'm gratified when people say, that they, they feel like women characters, and that was pretty good. But, uh, but I, want, I want to write novels that have strong women characters in it uh, that play important roles and don't kind of follow uh, perhaps the traditional, the stereotypical role that women often play in, in literature and in movies and in society. I, I, I wanted to showcase women uh, in more important roles. So, You'll see in all the novels there are women, I think, who are stronger characters, whether they're deputy ministers or, uh, or you know, the heads of, of lobbies or uh, running PR firms and that sort of thing. And uh, so uh, I just tried to listen to the women around me and, uh, and honor their voices in a way. But yeah, it was, it was actually pretty gratifying to read a book where the female, like the female main character, I guess, that wasn't... Um, sort of a damsel in distress. Right. Know, that, that actually sounded like a woman too often. I read like male authors that write women and they write women as sort of the way they've read women before. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, in my life, I'm usually the guy in distress. So, uh, <laughs> and it's often the damsel who bails me out. So, uh, uh, but I, so I wanted to write them in that way. And, and Landon Percival is a character that is very near and, and dear to my heart. Uh, I, I really enjoyed writing her. And she was an inspiration in a way to me. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> you, you, you strike me as a very decent man. And, 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 Hold the wool and, over and someone I, else's eyes. <laughs> and I applaud you for that. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, I, I can't quite fathom how you had a career in politics and, <laughs> and, and, and P PR. So uh, I left early. <laughs> I, I, would, I, would like to, I would like to hear you address, uh, do, you, do you feel like there's room in politics and PR any longer for decency? And can you riff on that a bit? Um, I, I do think, I'm an eternal optimist, as uh, may be uh, evident from the happy endings in my novels. Um, I do think there is hope for politics, but it's going to take an awful lot to turn around the ship. It's got 150 years of momentum behind how we practice politics in this country. And I don't think it, it will happen unless individual Canadians actually get engaged. We've had a steadily declining voter turnout in this country since the 1960s. Back when Lester Pearson was residing at 24 Sussex, 80% of eligible voters cast ballots in the elections. We're now down below 60%. Uh, and what it means is that in the last few elections, not since 1984, 
has the majority of Canadians elected a majority government. Now we have a minority of voters electing majority governments, which is not really how mm -hmm. democracy is supposed to work. Uh, so I think what happens is that we've grown disillusioned, disenchanted, sometimes disgusted with the brand of politics we practice. And what too many Canadians are doing is, in response to that, they are turning away from their democratic obligations, when if they want to see change, they really need to turn towards it and, and get engaged and learn the issues and demand a higher standard from their candidates and phone up the party offices and complain when you see that negative attack ad advertising on television that we've all come to loathe. Uh, and the reason they're still doing it is because it works. And it works because we're sitting on our hands. Uh, so I think it's a shared responsibility with our political leaders who, uh, who need to, I think, operate on a higher plane. And we need to push them there. And I'm not sure they're going to get there unless we do that. Uh, so I would encourage everybody to uh, exercise not just your, your right, I think of it as an obligation. Because if we don't vote in the election, we hardly have credible grounds on which to, to criticize the government we end up with. We end up with the governments we deserve. So uh, we need to get out there and vote. It's not that onerous. Reading the paper a little bit, asking questions, and figuring out where you feel, or where you are on the issues, how you feel about them, and, and, uh, and voting. And if we get that voter turnout back up to 70, 75 percent, particularly with younger Canadians engaged who are really at the low end of voter turnout, uh, they're the ones who are going to inherit uh, the government. They're the ones who are going to be leading the government in the future. Uh, and we, that's, right now, that's a lost generation in our, in our democracy. We need to get them back. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can help lead that process, all of us here. Boy, here, here, if you go back into politics, you've got my vote. <laughs> it's wonderful. Sorry. It's wonderful. I slip into proselytizing very easy. No, I love it. Terry follows for prime minister. Oh, there's the high sign. Last question, okay. Last question. Oh, there's only one person there, so perfect. So, hi, Terry. I've, Hello. I actually loved all your books for different reasons. I had a question about up and down. I actually meant to write you a couple of years ago. Mm. I really loved that story, and... Love the strong older woman character, and as a marketer, loved the campaign. Thought it was so courageous and uh, insightful. And then I think it was—I don't remember the timing, but at least a year after it was published, I was interested to hear on the news about a Canadian astronaut who had created this real sense of connection and humanity by building something on social media for the space right. program. And as soon as I heard that story, I said. That's up and down. Can anybody <laughs> see this? It, it <laughs> and I just me. wondered if you and he had had a conversation or whether. Well, I had to call in a lot of political favors to get him placed on that mission. So that <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't scheduled for two more shuttle missions after that. But uh, the book was coming out then. And uh, yeah. no, it was really, uh, there's been so many coincidences and serendipity that has followed all of these, these my first three novels at least. And certainly, Chris Hatfield's extraordinary journey beyond this realm was, uh, uh, was one of those serendipitous moments. And he really did. He did what, I, what the PR firm in the novel wanted to do, to rekindle, to reanimate public interest in the space program. And he did that single-handed with a high-speed internet connection uh, 90 miles above the Earth. Yeah. It did work. And he's also a very humble and a very nice guy. And he was the right persona to bring to that task. And very, I mean, quintessentially Canadian, uh, if you believe the stereotype. <laughs> uh, and uh, I met him once. I've only met him once. I don't know that he's read uh, the novel. Uh, but it was a thrill to hear him speak and to hear him sing his song that he wrote uh, about uh, you know, watching planet Earth from the, the space station. I did spend some time with Mark Garneau in, in writing uh, and researching up and down, and that was an extraordinary thrill to, to be in Mark Garneau's presence. Uh, I was unable to construct complete sentences for the first 10 minutes of our <laughs> meeting. I was just, you know, tongue-tied as I was just, I sh shook his hand for a really long time. <laughs> but that was, that was really fun. So yeah, I, I hope we have more Canadians who will, and I hope that this government continues to fund the Canadian Space Agency uh, in a way that allows us to exercise our rightful place at the forefront of, of space exploration and space science. Because 
Canada was the third nation in space. Not many people know that. We were the third nation in space. Uh, the Alouette uh, satellite was the third man-made object put into, uh, into space. And uh, so we have a long tradition uh, that we don't hear enough about, and I hope it continues. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. You have been a fantastic audience. Thank you so yeah, much for audience. your questions. Well, and you are lovely. What a pleasure to meet you, Satanchai. He is. Well, you are lovely, too. I've, well, I've watched Marcy for years, and I was tongue-tied back in the room there, oh, but so now I found it. But, no. uh, really a pleasure. Thank you. Best of luck. Thank Talk you very soon. Much. Come on the show soon. Love to come we'll on the show. We'll work it out. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.